We're sailing through the stormy North Atlantic. It's March, 1943. Above us, convoy SC-121. It's been two weeks since they set sail from New York with cargo crucial for the Allied war effort. Grain, fuel, ammunition, steel. But stormy weather means it's difficult to keep the convoy together. Boats become separated. They're easy targets. Prowling German submarines seize their chance. Over the course of three days, 13 merchant ships are sunk, with 500 men dead. One of the surviving ships, the SS Scorton, is carrying 6,800 tons of sugar. On the morning of the 10th of March, U-boat 633 raises its periscope to look for a target. But the submarine is spotted by the captain of the SS Scorton, who orders full steam ahead and rams the U-boat. The submarine sinks, taking 43 sailors to a watery grave. When the story gets out, it's a moment of perfect poetic justice. The merchant navy, who were so vulnerable to enemy attack that they lost a quarter of all men in the war, were now striking back. The prey had become the predator. But I don't think that's what happened. What do you mean? It's all in this book. Let me have a look at this. The collision incident reported by the British SS Scorton on 10th March 1943 actually involved U-229, which escaped without damage. Hang on. So he didn't even hit the... He didn't even hit U-633? Well, who sank it then? U-633 sunk by depth charges from the US Coast Guard Spencer. Well, that's annoying. Gonna have to get to the bottom of this. We've got a mystery on our hands. So what we have here is a story about how history works, the process of history. I have a particular theory which I'm quite emotionally attached to and I'm confronted with something which challenges that. So the only way we're gonna resolve this is by thoroughly examining the evidence available well, you're not really a historian if you're not prepared to be proved wrong, are you? <laughs> exactly. This is one of those stories where everything seems to contradict. From the number of ships in the convoy, to the number of U-boats who attacked it, to the number of men who died in each ship, everything differs depending on the source you use. Now, I knew that the piece of evidence crucial to my investigation was the original incident report from the Scorton, there I'd find all the information needed to understand what happened. That happened to be in the National Archives in London, so many thanks to John for retrieving it. This is what it says. Members of the crew report that, after being rammed, submarine broke surface right alongside a midship of the starboard side. She was listing heavily with the conning tower badly smashed. So whilst we don't know which submarine was hit, we have multiple witnesses testifying to the fact that a submarine definitely was hit, so that's a good starting point. Now, we're told that the conning tower was badly smashed. That's this bit which sticks out of the water. Would this be enough to sink a submarine? Well, there is precedence for it. In March 1941, U-100 was sunk when it was rammed by HMS Vanek. The conning tower was smashed and the actual metal of the submarine on the hull was torn and the submarine sank. So depending on the impact, it is possible for a submarine to sink from conning tower damage. I, I'm not sure that conning tower damage is necessarily enough to sink a submarine. Why is that? Well, it's not really part of the main pressure vessel. It's, it's important, but it's tacked on. It's a bit like the island on an aircraft carrier. So it could be damaged without actually sinking the submarine. And it did happen on a couple of occasions before. We know that in 1942, 
the U-513 was rammed by another big steamship freighter. And on that occasion, there was really very little damage. And we know that the 513 got away to fight another day. Okay, so you know, it's inconclusive with the conning tower angle, but that still doesn't disprove anything. Well, true, but there is also another problem in a way. What's that? Well, you know that report we were quoting from earlier? Yeah. Well, I know we can't like go through the whole thing on camera, but page one? <laughs> what about it? I'm going to read a bit. So this is from the director of naval intelligence himself. And he says, There is no tracking evidence to confirm the destruction of this U-boat, but the skill and efficiency of the master of the Squarton may well have saved his own and possibly other ships in the convoy from being torpedoed. And fair enough, it was a gutsy and brilliant thing to do, but we don't know, there's no actual evidence that it sank the attacking U-boat. Okay, well, I mean, all he says is that there's nothing to confirm it. But, you know, I take your point. It's hard to argue against that. So that's my theory, pretty conclusively scuttled. Pardon the pun. <laughs> right, you're going to explain why yours is so brilliant now. Ooh. Let's look at the locations of three vessels. We know that U-633 torpedoed and sank the SS Guido on the 8th of March. That was another freighter in the same convoy. We also know that although 10 people on the Guido were killed outright, the survivors went into the water and they were lucky enough to be rescued pretty quickly by the US Coast Guard cutter Spencer. So, the conditions were terrible in the Atlantic. It's very unlikely that U-633 got in a multi-mile torpedo attack. It's also very unlikely that the Spencer was far away from the Guido because in those conditions the crew would have probably drowned or died of exposure or hypothermia very quickly if the Spencer hadn't been able to get them pretty promptly. So you've got the, the three vessels are pretty close together. It seems reasonable that Spencer was close enough to U-633 to have successfully mounted a depth charge attack. All right, Captain Birdseye, but that doesn't actually prove anything. Anyway, I did my own digging. Yeah, you carry on digging. Obviously, I don't have access to the archives of the Spencer, so the closest that I could get was an article on the US Coast Guard website. We are told that the Spencer detected a submarine and released a series of depth charges. But there's nothing here to tell us which submarine was targeted or whether any of the depth charges hit or not. This doesn't prove anything. So we're at a kind of impasse. I can't prove that the Scorton sank U-633 any more than you can prove it was depth charges. Fair, I, I suppose. But where does that leave us? Well, historians have this one weird trick when this kind of thing happens. We can just ask the author himself. We got in touch with Axel Niestle to ask a few questions about his research and he very kindly agreed to an interview with us and to share his report, which uncovered the likely explanation for what happened to U-633. The Scotland incident took place on the 10th of March at 8.24 in the morning. U-633 uh, was lost very probably one day before because it uh, failed to respond to radio signals sent from U-boat command to the boat to report weather. So it was rather unusual that the boat failed to send a, re a requested message three times in a row. Usually it could happen that the boat was submerged and it could uh, respond to a request only later. But in this case, we have a time lag of uh, at least 10 hours between, which is unusual and it never happened usually in the U-boat arm. Spencer obtained a U-boat contact while it was trying to rescue survivors from a sunken merchantman, the, the Guido, which was romping in front of the convoy SC-121. So uh, Spencer never actually saw the U-boat. While they were trying to rescue the survivors, they got an underwater acid contact and attacked it with uh, six depth charges. So later on, it, it lost the contact, and that was it, usually. Uh, there is no evidence uh, on the side of, of Spencer having ever seen the boat, nor having identified it. All of this 
came only later, post-war, when we put together the various evidence. Uh, usually history in, in uh, connection with U-boat losses is very difficult because uh, during the war, the, the Allies, uh, once the U-boat was sunk without survivors, they never ever had a chance to find uh, evidence in, in order to identify the wreck or the boat being attacked. So this was all, all done post-war. When the war was over, the Allies just made a list of all the U-boats being sunk, and then they allocated uh, various forces and incidents on their side to be responsible for this loss. And this list was um, published in 1946, and that it was taken for granted. Never ever it was questioned, neither by historians, nor by those uh, readers who, who wrote it or who, who, who read it. So uh, it just took four decades to realize that something that had been published officially by the Admiralty in 1946 could be wrong. And in fact, it was wrong in many cases. This is actually the second time that the fate of U-633 has been updated. It was also believed, at one point, that it had been destroyed by an aircraft. The key piece of evidence as to which submarine was hit by the Scorton is the fact that U-229 was the only submarine in the area to attempt an attack on the enemy. So from what we've just found out, Here's what likely happened. On the 8th of March, the Guido is sailing slightly ahead of the rest of the convoy. It's vulnerable, unprotected. U-boat 633 seizes its chance and fires torpedoes towards it. At 9.50 a.m., the Guido sinks. The U.S. Coast Guard Spencer rushes towards the wreck of the Guido to rescue any survivors, who report seeing a submarine 500 yards away. At 10.21 a.m., the Spencer detects a submarine via ASDIC. The Spencer then releases a series of depth charges but there's no confirmation as to whether any of them hit. U-633 failed to make radio contact with other submarines after the incident. Repeated requests were made over the following days, but nothing ever came back. The submarine had simply disappeared. On the 10th of March, U-229 was prowling for a target. It had already sunk two other ships in the convoy, the Nail Sea Court and the Coolmore, with around 85 casualties. It wanted a third. At 11.15 Central European time, it fired three torpedoes which all missed their targets. At 11.24, the Scorton spotted and rammed a submarine. U-229 was the only submarine in the area at the time which reported an attempted attack on the enemy. So what happened to U-229 in the end? Well, it claimed another ship in April with 45 sailors dead, but it was sunk in September by HMS Keppel. But not until it had killed three... Um, allied ships and about 100 plus casualties. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And that's the end of the story. We've solved the mystery. We've been on this wild historical goose chase through sources and facts and theories and that's the end of it. Well, for me, it's really shed some light, though, on the, on the broader picture of the Merchant Navy and the fact that they didn't just regard themselves as bystanders. Well, exactly. I mean, I find the story of Captain Terrick Glover of the Scorton really interesting because he had the courage to say, you know what, I'm not having it. <laughs> Bang. And as the Director of Naval Intelligence said, that probably saved lives because U-229 had already sunk two ships from the convoy. Mm. It probably thought, oh, right, I'm a bit scared now, I'm not going to bother. And that bravery from an unarmed merchant vessel is, is really worth celebrating. Well, I hope he got some decent recognition for it. He did. He was awarded an OBE. 
You don't think of the OBE being awarded in a combat situation, do you? Well, exactly. It's because the Merchant Navy were officially classed as civilian. Hmm. So in September 1939, the first British ship to be sunk was the SS Athenia, and the captain was also awarded an OBE for his rescue efforts. And I came across another case recently of uh, some of the intelligence agents um, who were also civilians getting awarded the OBE, so I suppose it fits with that. Mm. But I suppose if you were just an ordinary sailor or ship's officer on one of these merchant navy ships, you might have felt a bit a bit jealous or a bit unfairly treated because you were in the same convoys running the same risks in many ways as the escorting Royal Navy ships, but you didn't really get the, the same deal, did you? Well, exactly. The Merchant Navy were essentially just subcontractors. So in the Royal Navy, the government would pay, clothe and feed you, but in the Merchant Navy, you were just paid for a voyage. So the ships were owned by private companies and then you signed on for each voyage. This meant that you weren't paid as well, you weren't treated as well, and it led to a lot of resentment about the the public memory of the Merchant Navy and the Royal Navy, especially when you consider 25%, you know, around a quarter of all sailors in the Merchant Navy died. That's a higher proportion than any Allied armed force. And these were men from across the British Empire. Without the Merchant Navy, there would be no Battle of the Atlantic. And, and without a successful outcome from the Allied point of view from the Battle of the Atlantic, then there couldn't have been a D-Day, there couldn't have been a successful conclusion of the war in Europe, because that was really just central to the UK survival, uh, really from the point of the Battle of Britain onwards, because where else do you get the fuel? Where else do you get the food that you're no longer able to get from the, the Empire? And you're right about popular memory, because you know we, we, we see all those war movies that we many of us grew up with, and it's all destroyers and corvettes and aircraft carriers. You don't really see the story of the merchant ships except as being sort of targets, really. Mm. For me, the lasting takeaway from this story is the fact that the convoy managed to arrive in Britain safely, including the Scorton. 13 ships and 500 men didn't they paid the ultimate price in trying to keep the Allies supplied. And one captain in an unarmed freighter did what was necessary to keep his ship and others safe. If you'd like to find out more about the Merchant Navy in World War II, I would recommend Richard Woodman's The Real Cruel Sea, although some of the U-boat facts have been superseded by later research, and, of course, for anything U-boat losses, Axel Niesle's German U-boat losses during World War II. Right, that's a wrap then. Shall we get some fish and chips? Excellent. And I will have my crisp and light brown.